I think we're recording. Do you see like a record button? Yeah. No, I don't. Oh, recording has started now. OK, OK, so this is um, May 17th and this is a land use committee meeting. And um, why doesn't everyone introduce ourselves? I'll start. My name is Ann Mazar. I'm Carolyn. I'm Carolyn Barthel and um, I'm an, a member. <laughs> um, Barry. Barry Adderola, Planning Board Representative. Um, Peter. Peter Coffin, CONCOM Representative. And Frank, Frank Nero, Member. All right, and we have a guest, um, Stephanie Cavino, and she is going to do a presentation for us, and we're going to start her off so she doesn't have to sit through our whole meeting. So, Stephanie, why don't you start? Sure. <laughs> Thanks for having me tonight. My name is Stephanie Cavino and I'm from the Blackstone Watershed Collaborative. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll tell you a little bit about um, what that collaborative is. All right. Are you good here? Can you see that? Yes. Yes. OK, I can't see you guys anymore, so hopefully <laughs> please that's OK. Can. Interrupt me if you need to, please. Um, <clears throat> You guys probably know this, but just some context about the watershed. Um, the Blackstone watershed encompasses 39 communities within two states. So we have 29 in Massachusetts and 10 in Rhode Island. It's about 475 square miles and drops 438 feet over those 48 miles um, in distance. And to compare that, if you look at the map on the top right there, that green part is the Blackstone watershed going into Narragansett Bay. So we're part of this larger Narragansett Bay watershed. That watershed on the right is the Taunton River, which is the other freshwater source for the bay. And that's also about 40 miles long and it only drops 40 feet over its length. Um, and we drop nearly 450. So we're a very steep watershed. Um, which comes into play of, of how we developed over time. We wanted mm. to make a recognition that we know that this is home to indigenous lands and it has been for millennia. Specifically, the Nipmuc tribe is um, most of the Blackstone watershed here, and the river has always been very important to those tribes as well. Um, originally, the Blackstone was called the Kittacook River, and our friends, uh, our partners at Friends of the Blackstone actually created a documentary, well, sort of a a movie documentary recently called Kittacuck Speaks, and it's the voice of the river um, through the seasons, looking at the river from more of a natural lens of, you know, what happened um, over the years and through the seasons instead of just looking at the Industrial Revolution and how the, t the river is typically talked about is this home of the Industrial Revolution. So because of that really steep change in grade over the 48 miles from Worcester to Pawtucket, we were able to dam the river in a number of different places, and we created the first water power cotton mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. We also created a canal in many places, sometimes replacing the river, sometimes next to the river, so that we were able to transport um, goods back and forth. It's also been a river of national significance in a lot of different ways. So I mentioned it was the hardest working river. Um, it's also called the most polluted river in America in terms of toxic sediments. Um, specifically, that was from an EP report in 1990. I don't know why I have these out of order here. Sorry, I should fix that. Um, in 1972, we were home to Operation Zap. And I don't know if anyone's heard about this before, but ZAP was actually America's largest one day regional environmental cleanup in US history, and that still stands. So 10,000 people got together and removed 10,000 tons of trash from the river. So this was when we were taking, you know, excavators over and taking out cars and refrigerators and bicycles and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. wow. So luckily we're not quite that bad anymore, but there's still definitely a lot to be done. Um, we're also part of the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage mm -hmm. Corridor, which is that green area on the right over um, over the map here. And then also in 2014, we created the Blackstone River Valley National Historic Park. So a lot of people don't realize that we have a national park right in our backyard. Uh, we have six different nodes to that park. So it's a little bit different than your typical, you know, driving into Yellowstone, you know you're in Yellowstone, but it's really interesting that we have that right here at home. Mm -hmm. And in 2022, it's pretty important we wanted to highlight that we are the, um, we have this 50th anniversary of 
this massive cleanup effort in 1972, Operation Zap, and it's also the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. So there's a lot going on this year for sure. So talking about us being part of the Narragansett Bay larger watershed, when we're kind of zooming out and thinking about where the Blackstone sits in relation to these other areas around the state and around the region, um, the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program noticed that there's a lack of funding in this area and there's a lack of projects. So on the left is a map from SNEP, which is the Southeast New England program, which does cover the entire Blackstone watershed. There's been probably about one project in the past five years. And on the map on the right is from the Division of Ecological Restoration, which is a statewide program that focuses on things like dam removal and culvert replacement. Um, and there's also only been a couple of projects in the past like five years. So it's not because the SNAP and the state um, grants program don't like us, and it's not because, you know, we're putting in bad grants. We're just not applying. And the sort of story of the watershed is that we have really wonderfully passionate people here, but we don't have a lot of capacity to think about the large scale, apply for these projects, and then manage those grants. So the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program said, you know what, we're going to change this. We're going to help. And so over two years from 2019 to 2021, they got together over eight meetings. The first one and the last one were in person. The rest were via Zoom. And even still, just at the you know beginning of COVID and everyone was very Zoomed out, they had about 140 different people attend those meetings, including 40 different organizations represented and 11 government agencies. And through all of that, they really identified the strength of the volunteerism in this watershed, and they talked about the different things that we need to do to work together and improve water quality and climate resilience within the region. So at the end of the two years, they came out with this Blackstone River Watershed Needs Assessment Report. I have physical copies of this. If you guys ever want them, I'm happy to drop them off. You can also, um, this is a hyperlink at the bottom, and I'll give you the PDF of this presentation, or you can go on the blackstonecollaborative.org website, and it's on there as well. So we looked at a number of different things from site specific projects to watershed wide and two of the things that we really highlighted were the need for capacity building and the need for watershed coordination. So out of all of that, we said, OK, here are the 20 different things we can all work on together. And the first one was simply creating a collaborative um, and having a staff person to be able to manage that. And I was the lucky individual to take that on. And from here, we're working together with our partners. We have over 100 different partners that we work with in the collaborative um, throughout the two states. And these are the 20 different things that we can do together that we all have kind of the shared vision, whether it's maintenance of our waterways, expanding our bikeway, creating equitable access to waterways, which not only means identifying where we don't have access. If anyone knows this picture, um, this is River Bend Farm in Uxbridge. It's one of the mm. very few points that we have easy access to the river. And that's also, even if you're mobility impaired, you can still get pretty close to the river here. Whereas a lot of places, the river is, you know, hiding behind a highway. Um, it's down a steep bank. There's tons of poison ivy. There are no steps. And, you know, it's it's difficult to get to it all, but especially if you have any mobility challenges, you really can't get to it. So we want to be able to improve that equitable access. We know that water chestnut is a big problem with our invasive species. Um, it's in a lot of our lakes and ponds and it's expanding. So we want to be able to stop it and then kind of push it back. And we know that also increased land protection really improves our water quality as well. We want to encourage nature based solutions so that low impact development using stormwater as a resource rather than a waste product and recognize developers that are using these types of best practices, manage their stormwater effectively, thinking about climate resilience and in, in the projects that they take on. We'd like to create a green jobs program focused on green infrastructure maintenance. A lot of communities come and they say green infrastructure is great, but I can't maintain it. You know, we know how to go out with a crew and a clamshell bucket, but all this handwork, that's not really something that we do. So being able to create a program that would support folks um, understanding how to maintain this, what to pull, what to keep, uh, would be really helpful, we think, moving forward and filling that need for municipalities. We're also fortunate that we have this really wonderful long-term monitoring program from the Blackstone River uh, Coalition. They have been doing water quality monitoring on the main stem and tributaries to the Blackstone for 19 years now, um, but we don't have enough funding for that program in order to be as effective as we can be. So sharing our results and getting a lot of communication out about those 
um, those water quality improvements or water quality numbers. And the last thing is improving aquatic connectivity. So for those who joined early, um, Anne and I were talking about this actually. So thinking about this is a culvert in this picture. Anytime you have a stream and a roadway crossing, um, there's an opportunity to think about how are we sizing this? Can fish go upstream of this? Is there um, passage for if you're a turtle and you want to go through here? Or depending on how big it is, you might even have a really large open box or um, arch culvert that even a deer or something could walk through. So thinking about our aquatic connectivity, both in terms of ecological benefit and wildlife passage, but also in terms of our roadways. So if this were to wash mm -hmm. out in with these really intense storms that we're getting from climate change, is that roadway going to collapse? Is that a public safety issue? Is this our main uh, channel to be able to get across town? Are there other ways that we have to go around? How much time does that add to our EMS? So it can be uh, really important for public safety. Yeah. Oh, here. So the Blackstone Collaborative is pretty new. We just started last September. We meet every month. Everyone's welcome to join that meeting if you'd like to. I know Anne's, I think, been on there a few times as well. Um, it's Our next meeting is actually this Friday from 10 to 12. It's every third Friday of the month. And like I said, we have about 200 different individuals representing about 100 different organizations, agencies, municipalities. So we have consulting firms. We have the wastewater treatment plant. We have um, small land trusts, large land trusts, the Nature Conservancy. See Narragansett Bay Estuary Program, um, pretty diverse group. And our goal is to implement these 20 different priorities of the needs assessment report over the next five years, which is a challenge, um, but some of them are just kind of starting off. And overall, that goal, like I mentioned, is improving water quality and climate resilience, specifically in this face of these development challenges, increased impervious surfaces, and then climate change, which I'll talk about in just a second. And we want to be able to bring this technical assistance and expertise to our communities and, and groups that have minimal capacity, but really thinking about equity and who needs it the most in, in as well. So overall, our water is getting a lot cleaner in this region. So in the past, you know, 10, 20, 50 years, we've made significant progress in terms of point source pollution. So our wastewater treatment plant, you can see this upper black stone here, that's had massive reductions in nitrogen loading from this wastewater treatment plant. Um, but you can also see that here on the right, this land use, we have very urbanized northern part of the watershed headwaters and pretty urbanized southern part in Woonsocket and Pawtucket. And we know that as that land use changes and we're getting more developed, our impervious cover is increasing and that means that our water quality is decreasing. So as that water runs off, instead of going into a forest, it's coming from that roadways and rooftops and parking lots, etc. It's taking the sediment from those areas. It's taking the nutrients which are attaching to the sediments. So just the things you're putting on your lawn sometimes of nitrogen, phosphorus, that plants need to grow, that's what we're collecting and what we don't want in our waterways. Also from climate change, we have these increased temperatures. We're getting warmer waters, which is really a challenge, especially in the black zone. We have a lot of uh, cold water fisheries as well that are being impacted. And I mentioned extreme precipitation. So when we have a ton of water coming all at once, our systems become very flashy when they're reliant on this impervious surface and this runoff. So we can flood at certain times, but also have increased drought because we're not putting water back into our groundwater supply. It's running off and going somewhere else in the watershed, which has started to lead to drinking water shortages. I'm not sure if that's something that Menden has experienced, but some of your neighbors in um, Uxbridge and Millville, for instance, have talked mm -hmm. about private wells starting to run dry. Mm -hmm. We know that these are serious issues for our municipalities and when if we want to have healthy communities, we're going to need to address these issues, whether it's uh, recreation and tourism base our physical and mental health that was really highlighted from COVID. Everyone went outside so much. They were really using all these recreational areas. Our built infrastructure, like I talked about with that culvert, um, if we're not addressing this, then our built infrastructure will be impacted and impact uh, our water quality. Our transportation systems. 
and also our municipal services. So if some of our residents are getting stranded or we can't get our EMS out, that's going to be a challenge. And in particular, we really want to think about avoided costs as well as not just how much those cost us to fix it, but how much are we saving because we're fixing it preemptively instead of waiting for something to fail before addressing it. And the other element to talk about is thinking about our most vulnerable citizens, which are typically those that are not always part of the decision making process, uh, but how these different things affect our, our most vulnerable citizens, whether they be um, those with young children or have mobility issues, those who are elderly or reliant on um, things that uh, require power at home, like oxygen tanks. So we know that these challenges from climate change are not felt equitably, whether it's throughout the watershed or within each of our municipalities. So this map is from the needs assessment report, and it looked at where we have heat islands, low tree cover, high asthma rates, flooding impacts and water quality challenges. And we can see that the same municipalities are being hit again and again from each of these. But outside of this, which in, within each of our communities, even if you're not mapped as an environmental justice area, we still have some of these vulnerable residents to think about as we're making decisions about land use. I wanted to highlight this, um, this opportunity. So the SNEP network uh, provides technical assistance to communities. So if you go on their website, they do, I believe, have a request for proposals open right now. And you can request assistance, whether it's through looking at your bylaws and regulations and how they address climate change and nature-based solutions, or if it's a specific project that you have coming up in town that you'd like feedback about. They also have specific expertise in financing and funding of climate resiliency projects. So the Blackstone Collaborative has been working from all different types of projects to from the site scale all the way up to state and regional. So we are part of an urban wetland restoration project in Worcester. Uh, we've participated in the last two municipalities going through the MVP process in this region, which were Boylston and Millville. Uh, we're trying to get these resolutions passed in each of our communities supporting the needs assessment. And we're also part of this larger conversation as well. So I work a lot with municipalities directly and I hear about what their challenges are and what their concerns are and I try and elevate those because like I said the Blackstone I think hasn't been um, you know given the attention that we really deserve and so if I can bring these these challenges and needs up to this larger level so the Central Mass Regional Planning Commission um, they're creating a plan for 2050 I'm part of the Mass ECAN which is the Ecosystem Climate Adaptation Network which is a statewide program, and I'm the co-chair of the Nature-Based Solutions Work Group. I'm also on the steering committee for the Massachusetts Statewide Climate Change Assessment Working Group, which will create the new climate um, hazard mitigation and climate adaptation plan, the SHIMCAP, which is a great acronym if you know all the acronyms. And I'm also on the steering committee of the Narragansett Bay Estuary Program. So I'd love to hear, you know, what some of the challenges might be that you're you're dealing with and addressing, um, and be able to take those and, and elevate them. To transition into something a little bit more positive, I know we talk a lot of, um, you know, challenges, 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 but we also wanted to highlight some of the great things that we have in this region. So we have a lot of history, we have a lot of opportunity for recreation, and a lot of opportunity for these nature-based solutions. So every third Saturday from April to July, we're doing Blackstone Days, whether it was creating our own event or highlighting other events occurring in the watershed. So we had a poetry event and hike in April. Um, this Saturday, we're going to be doing the first strike festival in Pawtucket. So it was the first uh, mill strike in America where 100 women mm. organized, got together and actually huh. won. And they said, we're not going to have these long hours and crappy pay. Um, it's a very interesting story. In June, we're going to be highlighting the Summer Solstice Festival in the Blackstone River Theater. And then in July, we're gonna do a tour of nature-based solutions in uh, Worcester. We wanted to make sure we're including some of the headwaters as well. I also mentioned Operation Zap and the 50th anniversary. So if you go on their website, zaptheblackstone.com, not to be confused with zaptheblackstone.org, um, 
They're doing a cleanup greenup on August 27th. So anyone can say, hey, I want to do a program in my community anywhere in the watershed, whether it's uh, tree planting or stormwater stenciling or a recycling program or um, an actual uh, trash cleanup, whatever works for you guys, you can go and register there. Or if you want to just volunteer and see what's going on and what other events might be happening in the area, you can look it up there as well and just participate. And I should say, if you're looking for help, um, if you say Menden has an area where we'd love to do this, but we need volunteers, you can also register your event and ask for volunteers. On the other end, we're having a celebration on September 10th. So more of a, a fun one um, at Old Slater Mill in Pawtucket, and there'll be food trucks and music and, and um, dancing and things like that. And thank you so much for your time and uh, being able to go over this. And um, I sent over a draft of that resolution. I'm happy to change any of that language or highlight things that are important to you. And again, if there are certain challenges that you wish, you know, people would pay more attention to, let me know and I'd, I'd love to elevate those concerns. Do you, Stephanie, do you have the, um, the resolution that you could put yep. on the screen possibly and maybe even go over it? Yep. Um, so let me share my screen again with this different screen. I didn't see the, the resolution in your email, and I don't think. I did send it in the recent one. It was a long time ago I sent it out. But oh, I, OK. All right, I can look for it. So it's it's shared here as well. Um, this is sort of the long version. I can um, cut it down as, as much as you like if there are other things you want to include. But basically, it has a little bit about, you know, the history of the region. It's home to indigenous communities, birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. Um, there's a lot more we need to do that we created this needs assessment report and that the town recognizes the value of these recommendations and hopes to support them within their own goals. So supporting free and equitable access to public use and benefit of waterways, accelerating the management of water chestnut, um, increasing land protection, supporting development of a wetland restoration strategy, uh, mm -hmm. supporting planning and installation of low impact development practices such as rain gardens, advocating for new sections of the bike way and greenway, um, increased maintenance of waterways for wildlife recreation and safety, and recognizing Operation Zap in those two events that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, it's very non-binding. There aren't a lot of teeth here. The only thing that we even sort of allude to is uh, that we support this collaborative, appreciate the efforts of all the groups involved in the creation and continued maintenance, and intends to include these priority actions into local planning, local municipal goals as relevant, such mm -hmm. as open space and climate resiliency planning. Mm -hmm. I, 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 at some point, I'd like to ask a question. Sure, yeah, please do. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, Anne, did you have, were you going to say something first? No, why don't people ask questions and then I can. Okay. okay. Uh, You've mentioned a couple of times about land protection. I'd like to understand what that means. Yeah. So typically when we say land protection, we mean something that's going to go into um, chapter 91. So it would be permanently protected in perpetuity, whether it's managed by the conservation commission or a land trust or um, the state. But I think any form of, you know, less impervious, more green space is going to be a good thing, whether it's mm -hmm. chapter 61 program and it's only um, temporary or something more permanent. Okay. All right. Um, you were talking about the new, the nitrogen that was coming from uh, from Worcester, and it's also prevalent down in Pawtucket. And is there, you know, is there something that we can do to reduce that? To, you know, because I would think that in the long haul, it would actually Im Im improve. Anything we could do would would be an improvement. Yeah. Do you mean the point source from the wastewater treatment plants, or do you mean just non-point source stormwater runoff? I yeah, not uh, non-point. I mean, I'm just thinking about um, you know, could could there be? I, I don't. I'm. I, you have to understand, I'm new to this committee, but so I'm going to ask a dumb That's question. That's okay. <laughs> no, I'm happy to hear it. I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding. Yeah. Um, uh, 
I, just from I, like runoff from lawns and, and roadways yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something that, you know, we all play a part in. Um, definitely Worcester is very impervious. It's in our headwaters. Um, yeah. There's a lot that we can do up there. Um, yeah. But I think it's something that is a challenge everywhere. Um, so mm-hmm. all of our communities are under the, well, not all, most of our communities are under a stormwater permit, a NIPTES permit, the National Pollution Elimination Discharge National Pollution Discharge, and I'm not going to say it right. NPD, <laughs> yes. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Discharge elimination system. Um, so it's, there are certain regulatory requirements about their best practices for, you know, cleaning out storm drains and doing street sweeping and um, doing monitoring and things like that. So those are becoming more stringent over time. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that as water quality is becoming you know, we've gotten a lot of the low hanging fruit and now it's a little bit more challenging to address. We're, we're really kind of diving into that a bit more. Mm-hmm. Okay. Are there resolutions and things or, or, or bylaws that we could, that, I don't know, I'm asking, I'm, and I'm asking this of you, I suppose. Are there, are there, you know, are there things that we could do in Menden that would help? I mean, we're, you know, I, uh, we everybody has lawns mm-hmm. <laughs> and not everybody does good things with their lawns that are good for the water mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, definitely I general information is good um yeah. one thing that we did though many years ago is we became an uh, mvp community or municipal vulnerability preparedness mm-hmm. community and stephanie was great helping us um do that and so we've gotten two grants from them, and one was to integrate low impact development techniques into the bylaws and the subdivision regulations. So that that's one thing that we did. And now we need to encourage um, the planning board and the conservation commission and everybody to use it. And then the other the other thing we did was we got a grant to design the town hall campus area um, so that it would. Um, use green stormwater management systems and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. have pervious surfaces and landscape and everything. And and at the last town meeting, we got the fund, we got the um, MVP grant to design the landscape and all the infrastructure. And then at the town meeting, we got the money to do it. So all right. that was and and it's also supposed it will be a um, an example. And so we'll have some like education and training to show other towns like and people and builders like this is what low impact development is. So those are a couple of things that we've been in, but. You're actually uh, ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. You have such a, whenever someone says like, oh, I wish we had a local champion, people say, well, what does that really look like? And I say, Ann Mazar, that's <laughs> what a local champion looks like. Someone who totally gets it, who's really yes. involved, who understands it from multiple angles, who's great at explaining everything and finding the money yeah. and, just you are guys are so lucky to have yes. Anne in town. I, I'm keenly aware how lucky we are. <laughs> we we she has she has shaped this this town in amazing ways that probably would never have happened. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I I'm, I'm don't want to monopolize the question time. So well, yeah. Does anybody else have questions? Questions? Yeah. Barry or Peter, Frank? Stephanie, earlier, this is Frank, by the way. Earlier, you mentioned as uh, part of the network, uh, you could request assistance or feedback or funding of projects. Is this through your organization? And as do, do we join this resolution with that in mind? I know it doesn't have a lot of teeth, but w- w- other than benefiting the uh, environment, which is important, what are the benefits to us land use committee adopting this resolution and and implementing it, which I I think we uh, may implement a lot of these policies anyway. So so what exactly does this uh, entitle us to or encourage us to do and so forth? Sure. 
So to be perfectly honest, if you ask me for help, I will give you help whether you have passed this resolution or not. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, this is more for education outreach, kind of like, hey, this mm -hmm. is available to you more than anything else. The resolution is really something that we can show, um, to be perfectly frank, to show our funders and say, look, like we work with communities and we talk to them and, you know, they've gone so far as to decide they're gonna support a resolution in town to say that this is helpful. Um, so you certainly don't have to pass it. I have worked with one community that said, you know, we'd love to work with you, but we don't wanna pass a resolution. We just feel uncomfortable about it for some reason. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly, you know, it looks good when you go to apply for funding to the state maybe and say, you know, we've done all this work and we wanna do um, you know, more education outreach, or we want to do a culvert assessment, or we want to replace a bridge or, or something like that and say, we know how important this stuff is. And we've even gone so far as to work with the Blackstone Watershed Collaborative, we passed this resolution, um, you know, we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is. So that might be of, of um, mm -hmm. assistance in some way moving forward for your own grant purposes. But for me, if you say, hey, staff, can you write me a letter of support for our new MVP plan? I will do so. If you are incorporating any of this stuff, and as long as it makes sense to me, I'm happy to support you. If you contact me and say, you know, we're looking for help, we have a culvert that we know we want to replace, we don't really know where to start, I'll meet with you. I'll talk about different opportunities. I'm going to Hopedale tomorrow to talk about a stream daylighting project, and I've incorporated, I brought in the state for that. So um, we're going to get some technical assistance and, and talk about what next steps might be. So no matter what, I want to be a resource for your community, and this presentation is is you know, my top priority is just to say like, hi, I exist. I hope you email me. I would love to connect you with resources um, more than anything else. But, you know, a resolution is a cherry on top for me. Thank you. That was very, very uh, helpful. Thanks. Yeah. And I will say when you're writing grants, when you can write down, you know, say that, yes, Menon's part of this, you know, res resolution and then, you know, show it you get so many brownie points for that and it's really helpful for writing grants yeah yeah, yeah that's great um i had i i sort of had the impression too stephanie that like if you know you were going to apply for like a grant for the region it would also be helpful for you to say wow look at all these towns that we pulled together and now we want to you know apply for this grant to do something in the region, you know, some project. Is that true? Yeah, exactly right. So I recently put in a grant to SNAP, the Southeast New England program, um, to do culvert assessment in this region and to do training um, for municipal staff and, and folks who are interested in general. Um, so the way that the state determines how to prioritize culvert replacement is through this statewide database. And it looks specifically at ecological function. Whether we're concerned about transportation or public safety or whatever, this DER program, which is how we have money for culvert replacement, is about ecological function. Because we haven't assessed our own culverts in the region for that ecological function. Sorry, my dog is rolling around in the background here. <laughs> um, she's. Got a new ball today, this silly golden retriever, and she's very excited. Um, <laughs> so we want to be able to go out and do the assessment to be able to put data into this specific database so that then communities are one step ahead in terms of, okay, what is our priority and how can we get this funding in our community? So we probably have about 5,000 culverts in the region in the Blackstone watershed, and we have 25 in this 13 state database. So we have a huge need for this. So I've applied for funding to be able to do this program. And it is helpful for me to say, we're working with communities. We have the buy-in. Here's an example. But you're saying that there are 5,000 culverts and only 25 are getting any attention? It's not that they're getting attention. It's just that someone actually went out, someone who's um, certified in this program, you have to get certified, which is also a barrier. Um, mm -hmm. So. The, the training program I'm hopefully going to get funding for to certify 80 people in the program. We have like two in the state right now. Um, oh. Yeah, oh. so those 25 are in this database. So the database, it runs a model throughout the whole watershed, and it basically says, or out the whole state really, it says, what if we took out this one, this culvert or this bridge or this whatever? 
how would that improve ecological function? How would that prove improve you know fish passage and terrestrial passage? What if we took out this one? What if we took out this one? So it determines which ones are most important. And so mm -hmm. if we run it right now, because it's entirely based off of a model, it's not very accurate and it's not that helpful. And communities can't say, oh, I want to do this because this program says it's important. Whereas if we go on the ground, we go out, we measure everything, we see what condition it's in. Is it already falling apart? Is it, um, you know, in, in perfect shape? It's brand new. We don't want to touch this one. Is it perched so that the, the culverts up here and the water levels down here, no one can get up? You know, we look at all these things. We put that data into the database. It's going to run a much more effective, um, useful mm -hmm. model to mm -hmm. prioritize. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anne and Stephanie. This is Peter. Uh, nice presentation, Steph. Uh, and I think uh, Menden is already doing a lot of these things, and none of it is really uh, too out there, or uh, I like to think that it shouldn't be uh, causing contention. But it would be most appropriate if it was a vote of the selectmen to endorse this. So. Uh, do you want me to make a motion that we should ask the selectmen to uh, approve the statement? Yeah, well, as an, that actually was one of my questions, Peter, to Stephanie, is would it be better to have the select board, you know, approve it? So in most of our communities, we have had the select board make that vote. Um, in one community, so far, we had the Conservation Commission make the vote, but then later they said, actually, we do want Select Board to make it too. So they just provided a recommendation to their Select Board. Mm -hmm. um, another community similarly did that. First, they wanted me to meet with CONCOM, and then they provided a recommendation to the Select Board uh, to adopt it. So if you want to have just the Land Use Committee approve this, fantastic. I am happy for your support. If you would prefer to um, provide that recommendation to your Select Board, and I can do this again with, with them, I'm happy to do that as well. Yeah, Peter. Hi, Barry, I'd roll up. Oh. Hey, Barry. I'd, I'd be happy make I'd be happy making a recommendation to the selectman from the land use committee. I'll second Wait, that. I don't know if you That's good because I think the selectman they need to hear it. <laughs> so uh, maybe not as long as what you've done with us, but. Uh, you do a great job, so I think that that would be an appropriate thing if we could get you in front of the new select board with new members. Sure. Are there particular things that you think are important to highlight for Menden? Well, our big focus is Lake Nipmuc. So, you know, uh, nitrogen for the Narragansett, eh, it's kind of a long ways away. But, uh, and nitrate doesn't uh, travel too well. I would have a Personally, there's more focus on phosphorus as all the ponds. Uh, we've invested in uh, invasive weeds, and that's a kind of a contentious pro uh, topic as to how long it's taken and whose money has gone to that. But I think we can point to successes. We got issues with beavers, and is that whose job that is? Uh, we've done a great job of buying land, but you got to keep pushing because some people think we're taking tax land off the tax rolls. So it's uh, we need to constantly stress the good things that come from it. I'm going to stay away from the beaver topic, but the other ones definitely. <laughs> um, I, I, can I just ask a question? I got kicked off the meeting because I had problems with the Internet. What did I miss? It was no. Barry started to ask a question, and so I... Well, I said that I'd be I'd be comfortable making a recommendation to the selectmen from the land use committee to, okay. to adopt the resolution. OK. And I just asked if there are particular things to mention that were important in Menden and um, Peter was just going over a couple of those, including the uh, late Lake Nipmuc water quality, phosphorus, beavers, which I'm, I'm not going to address that one <laughs> and the importance of land protection. Yeah, what about, what about just um, uh, water quality for the wells is that too boring or too you know is that is that I don't know does that is that relevant so I'm not sure that there have been a lot of water quality challenges for private wells necessarily um, 
what I've heard from communities more, and correct me if I'm wrong and things are different in Menden, but there are some wells that have gone dry and had to be redrilled, which can be a massive um, cost for a, you know, a family. Yeah. So Menden has no, no public sewer and very little public water, so it's always good to get public education as to you come from the city and welcome to a septic system and keep the grease right. out and don't paint and uh, get it pumped out on a regular basis. Can't, can't hear that enough, I think. Yeah, and I would say that the septic systems, they have a, can have a really negative effect on water bodies if they're not maintained, which I think yeah. is a problem with Lake Nipmunk. You know, there's some issues there. Mm. Um, um, just, I know you don't want to talk about beavers, um, Stephanie, but are you familiar with um, Beaver Solutions and Mike Callahan? Okay, because they're great. Yeah, beaver deceivers, they call them. <laughs> well, <hit> bad, <laughs> We have two in Menden. Yeah, it seems like they work for a while and then. You have to maintain them. And yeah. if you do, they work. Okay. Yeah. In the right location. That's the thing, because some of them don't put, um, they don't work in every location. And so they're good about evaluating a, a, a location to see, you know, if they work. But anyways. So did someone make a um, motion then? Was that Barry? Barry yes. made the motion and it got seconded. Yes. Yeah. And did you second it, Peter? No. <laughs> no I, I did. It. Okay. Great. Could could we, uh, Stephanie? Could, if you could stop sharing your screen, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So we have a motion on the uh, table. Yep. Yeah. Um, is there any more discussion? I think it's a great idea. All right. Well, why don't we vote? Um, all those in favor? Barry, aye. 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 Peter, aye. Frank, aye. Okay. okay. Carolyn's aye. Yeah. Carolyn, aye. aye. And Anne, aye. All right. Yep. So what we'll do is we'll bring it to the select board then. And I think it would be helpful if you could do the presentation because it's really educational and interesting. So I guess we'll uh, find out when we can get on this. Thing. We get quite a few more people watching a selectman meeting than a land use committee meeting. So the townspeople have better uh, better understanding of what's going on with it too. Those, those that are interested in watching the meeting. That, that's a good point, Barry. <laughs> Yeah, Pete, Peter mm -hmm. mentioned to make it shorter for select board. Um, so if you have specific things that you know think are not as relevant, let me know. I'm happy to cut it out. All right. Yeah, I thought it was or good. I can just kind of skim over things a bit more. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was all useful. It all you know it just keeps building, and you know there's more evidence that uh, more things that we need to think about, and more. Um, and why, you know, and this is an underfunded area. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Stephanie, so much. We've been trying to get together for like months. <laughs> Just haven't been able to. So um, Excuse thank me, you. And you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be contacting us, the uh, selectmen to get it on the agenda. Yeah. Yes, I will. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. And yeah, Anne, anytime you want to get coffee, please let me know. I'm not too far away. <laughs> and um, let me know when it works for the select board, and I'm happy to come back. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you, Steph. Yeah, Stephanie was has been super helpful with Menden, to Menden. So I've been wanting to get around this meeting, you know, so we could find out about this. But great. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. Um, did you have a chance to look at the minutes of the uh, March 29th meeting? I did not. Hmm. They're on the email. You want to look at them or have other people looked at them? I reviewed it quickly. Yeah. Okay. Barry? Yeah, I read them. Okay. Yes. Okay. Do you want to just look at them, Carolyn? And um, uh, sure, I can try. 
Is it? Oh, there we. Oh, there we go. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right, this looks fine. Does someone want to make a motion? Make a motion to accept the minutes of March 29th as written. And I'll second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Carolyn, aye. Frank, aye. Barry, I. All right. Um, so the next item is the Beaver Solution devices. Um, so in the we have two of them. One is on Inman Pond and one is in the Menantown Forest. But downstream from the one in the Menantown Forest, um, another dam has gotten built. And so we had the Beaver Solutions people come in and look at it, and they said it's actually an ideal location for the um, the um, Beaver Solution device. Because um, there's enough elevation. If there's not enough elevation, it doesn't work. For example, they came and looked at Lake Mc, um, Nipmunk where they're having issues, you know, hoping that we could put a device in. Because once you put them in, then you don't have to, It you know, it, it keeps working. You have to maintain it each year. But then you know, the beavers can kind of be there and um, it doesn't flood. Uh, but at Lake Nipmunk, there wasn't enough elevation. So they um, said, you know, you have to trap them. And that's what they do at Lake Nipmunk. Um, and so the Conservation Commission has a $5,000 um, fund for beaver management and they have $5,000 in it. So I was asking if we could use some of that money to put a device in on the town forest. And um, also, the New England Mountain Biking Association said they would um, give some money. And I'm also going to apply for a grant because uh, from the MSPCA. But the amount of the um, device is $2,274. I mean, $2, so anyway, so I'm just kind of like letting you know where we're at with that. And I... Okay. Can the original device that's there in the town forest can that be relocated downstream to be more more effective? No, because then it, the, you need both of them in the the way it's laid out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so I'm asking the conservation commission to um, apply for the grant, and then we might be able to get five hundred dollars. So that's um, sort of where we're at. But one way that these devices do work year from year is that we do maintenance on them and so we've done them for the other two and i would if we put this third one in i'd like to have the maintenance done on this one also um so anyways i'll come back to you on that but uh we we sort of the <laughs> the land use committee used to have 50 dollars in our budget <laughs> <laughs> and so then we um, started doing the management for the um, Beaver Solution devices, so we got a little bit more. But now we have around two thousand five hundred um, dollars that we have to use, which has been really helpful for you know the work on the open space properties and things like this. So, um, I don't know. Any questions? No. no. Okay. Sounds like it needs to help. You know, whatever we need to keep rolling because we. Beavers will, will keep build, building. Yeah, I mean, the thing is too, like if you um, trap them, they'll keep coming back. You know, they keep populating. So, um, but sometimes that's what you have to do, like on uh, Lake Nipmunk. But, you know, like in open space, you want to keep the wildlife in there if you can. And so I do like to use these devices if we can. So, Ann, you had mentioned roughly a $2,300 expense. This is Frank. Yep. Um, uh, a grant of about 500. 
uh, a donation from the New England Biking Association of approximately, do we know how much? Five, they said like 500. Yeah, the, the device is $2,200. Yeah. And they have, and the CONCOM has $5,000, which they'll get replenished July 1st. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to get some money from them. Hmm. And do you think we'll be able to collect all the money without hitting our budget? Yes, I well, I, yes, I think so, because um, I think that we'll be able to get the grant money. But I have to write the grant, so we have to see. But I would like to use the um, land use committee money to maintain the device so that when they come once a year, they can just do all three and we would just cover the cost. And and I think also at the next annual town meeting, maybe ask for a little bit more money in the account, the land use account. I mean, because our account's very modest. So, you know, even if I ask, uh, we ask for like 500 or $1,000 more, it would be helpful. And do we know what the maintenance costs are, uh, you know, let's say per Beva solution, roughly? All right. So I will let you know what happens on that. I'll, I, I'll, um, probably through emails that sort of keep you updated. Okay, um, so are we making a motion tonight or are we just we discussing this earlier? But through the Solarize Mass Plus program, we enough people put solar on their roof that the town of Menden has um, a free 25 kilowatt system that we can get the benefits of. It, actually, it's Menden and Upton. And so we're trying to figure out where we could put the um, system. And we were trying to do it on the schools because then, you know, both schools, I mean, both towns, Menden and Upton, um, you know, share the cost of the schools. But they, their roofs um, are going to be replaced like in five years and they just didn't have a location. So what we're looking at now is possibly putting the panels on the Menden library and then having the um, benefit of the solar go to the Menden Library and the Upton Library. So that's just the sort of an Library update. If anybody has another location or an idea, um, Carolyn and I are working on that. So let us know. Is the Menden Library tied into the Upton Library as a, as a uh, regional? Right. So no. the next thing I want to talk about. Um, no, and, and there was, did you hear the question? Encroachment. We've gotten surveys to survey the different properties. And on 32 George Street, that will be surveyed in early June. And then Inman Hill Road, we had surveyed. And um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to put signs up. Um, and sort of can you hear us? Bound, property boundary signs that say on the, on the um, edge of the property, reservation boundary, private property beyond the sign. Please respect the property rights of and privacy of our neighbors and remain on the reservation land. And that sort of shows where the end of the um, property is, but it also shows the owners like where the, the, the open space is so they shouldn't be encroaching on it. And I just want to show you a couple of pictures of the encroachment. So I'm going to try to share the screen. I don't know. Let's yeah, see. Can you hear us? Anne? Anne, can you hear us? Carolyn, are you muted? No. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, can hear, hear you. you but you but, can, you're not hearing but us. But you can't hear us. Oh, I can't. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, there, there were some. Um, here, let me just put it in the chat. Uh, let's see, where is the chat? Here. Um. I'm not sure why I can't hear you. Wait a second. Oh, sorry. I can't. Can, can, Testing can, one, can, two, three. Okay, I can hear you. I'm sorry. So did someone say something? I'm sorry. Yeah, yes. Okay. I asked the yeah. question about the libraries. I asked if the Menden Library was tied into the Upton Library and a regional library as a regional library. Regional no. library. Yeah, did, did you answer it, Carolyn? No, I didn't because okay. you jumped right into the next topic. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So it, what they would do is um, the energy that those solar panels would produce, they would just divide it 50-50 and the savings would go to the Menden Library 50% and 50% would go to the Upton Library. 
they, right. they can direct those savings. Just it's a matter. It's it's just a, a paperwork thing. And so then that uh, the the billing would you know the the increase the source would be just from the way uh, the solar company sets it up. Does that make it clear? Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I can hear you now. <laughs> <laughs> Not on the library. I'm good on the library. All right. So I'm okay. I'm going to try to share the screen. Let me see. Oops. Oh dear. <laughs> can, can you see my screen? I only see me. Okay. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Now can you see? Um can you see oh, pictures? Yeah. yeah. So okay. Okay. So this first one is on Pond Street. Um the red line shows where they encroached. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this was all encroached on and the wall was built. And so they removed the wall and um, the developer paid to reseed the area with native plants. So that's that's being resolved. Um, we have a picture of the existing conditions as they stand now. Um, hmm, I mean, I do. Let's see. I would have to find them in my photos, though. How about yeah. how about if I send you a picture? Let me see. All right. Uh, just see if I quick. OK. All right, so this. Um, here's a, a picture sort of. The wall is out. Can you see that? Yes, it's a, di it's a different perspective, so it's a little hard to compare. It is, but I'll show you. The wall was right here, was down here. Where, and the, where the road was, where the where the sign is? Yeah, sort of where the sign is. And okay. um, they put the open space signs way in the open space. So they took the wall out. This is planted with um, native seeds, grass seeds and flower seeds. And then they, a fence was put on, and this is the border now. And that sign that says town amended and open space is now by the fence. Oh, so the, the sign got moved. Yes. Closer to the fence. Okay. Yes. Great. Alan Greenberg um, did that. And Great. I would say that's kind of sort of the best picture. Um, and then, so th these are some other um, encroachments like wood but that's no big deal they moved it that's another picture of the wall um a bigger uh let's see wait i just want to see if i can find okay there's another one um on that property which i do not have at my fingertips but um it's it's like big piles of wood. There's like a um, a shed, you know. And so, anyways, uh, you know, once those the borders are marked, what I'd like to do is um, pay Alan Greenberg to put the signs in, so that everybody sees where the border is, and then people can like move onto their side of the property. Um, what do we what 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 property are we talking about? Are we still on Pond Street. Do we, this is Gaskill. Yes, Pond Street. Um, Gaskill Meadows. This is the open space. Okay. The pictures I was showing you of the wall and everything, that was over here where my cursor is. But now this red line is what we're having um, surveyed. And so what I'd like to do is put a sign like behind each property so that people know like where the border is. We, we, given that ver that southernmost one, which is the largest property, mm -hmm. when you when you have it, 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 there are different angles to the to the property. Would you have it at each angle? Yeah. Or so one would go. Whoops. One would go here. One would go there. One would go there. So every straight edge would have one sign. Yeah. Just 
you know. Yeah. That so this is the, the open space is the land that we were given because of the uh, the subdivision, right? Yes. So all this land is needed to the town amendment. Yes. Okay. So that's the one property. And then the other one we did was Inman Hill Road. And that was just recently done. And the borders looked great, except for one piece where this is where the um, this is where the line is, the open space right here. Somehow and all this is in the open space. Wait, wait a minute. Where's where's the, oh? It. We're not seeing any red line. Well, it's not a, okay. Orange, sorry, orange, orange steak, orange steak. Do you see it? Okay. It, Do you, you see, see that orange the steak? Yeah. There is yeah. a little bit of an orange steak in front of the two trees, but what's right here? Of, yeah, yeah, got it. Okay. So, so the, what, what what property is that? This is um, one on Inman Hill, and the um, surveyor is on vacation, and so I don't know the number yet, but it's. Um, it's like maybe like 15 in Mill Hill maybe, or I, I don't want to say because I don't know the, the lot yet. But anyways, this is the where border is from- relation to, Where is it in relation to the town on lot that we sold? Um, I don't know because what they did was is they took a picture. Um, I asked them to take a picture at every stake they put in. And so, most of them are it's all woods and it's fine <clears throat> but this one there's encroachment and so i asked what lot number was this behind and he said the guy's on vacation so i'll find out next week so he'll let us know so next is week. The encroachment is the encroachment the right side of the picture or the left side of the picture left so the border is here like from one stake to the other the right is their house i believe but I need to clarify that, but I'm pretty sure that the right is their, you know, yard and then the left where this house is or whatever shed is in the open space. Yeah, yeah that picture's not doing it for me. I, not, I can I can imagine. I would, that. Have, I would have to see it late. I would have to see it laid out on the on the drawing that you had sent mm -hmm. that we use for our for uh, for laying out the surveys and the, the one we voted on to, for the funds because. If I remember correctly, my 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 memory serves that there was land that we were going to have surveyed because the town amendment owned it, and there was other land that had unclear title that we were not going to have surveyed. And so I just want to make sure that this is on the land that we this is on the land that we voted to have surveyed based on that that aspect that some of the, that the town did own have clear title to that land. The um survey that fact, was done. The, survey, the, the, the amount of the survey the money that the money that was appropriated for the survey was was decreased based on the fact that the survey was not going to be done on the land that had that didn't have clear title that's, it was. that's, what, my, that's, that's what my memory serves it was and you're There's correct been, but you know what i'm sorry i said you're right they reduced the price because we asked them to stop where the clear title ended yeah but they surveyed it anyways Oh. So we have the information. That's, that's mute if it's not town, if it doesn't have clear title. Except for the town does own it. Like you can see it on that. Clear title. It doesn't have clear title. I, I, I don't understand how the town can own it if it doesn't have clear title. If it has clear title and the town owns it. If it's. Um, Where did the, the property come from? Well, this this was um, the wood property, and wood. Mm-hmm. So when did and, you sell it to the town amendment? Oh my goodness, it was like twenty years ago, maybe. And he there's didn't no, want no to record of it. Record of the selling of the land. Yeah, if if Herbie Wood sold the town to to sold the land to the town amendment, there would be a record of it. It'd be recorded in the Worcester County. There Bills. is. There is and the reason why I'm, the reason why I'm saying that is because I bid on that lot. OK. Oh, the 15. And the, and the bids yeah. were withdrawn. The bids, excuse me, the bids were withdrawn. 
And Sharon Cutler and Dennis Shaheen took the bids back because yep. they were afraid that Dale Plow was going to buy that lot and put a subdivision on that property. And they right. decided that they were going to take a strip of land off the back of that lot, and which they did. That's, yep. why the, that's why the lot lines don't line up, so that that lot could not access the back of that property. If the right. town of men that owned that land 20 years ago, they would not have done that. The, what, what happened when the land was bought was that um, when the town was doing, actually, I think it was Metacomet Land Trust that did the um, title search. And they, they, they couldn't clear the title in this portion of the property. And so they said to um, Herbie Wood, if you clear the title, then we will pay you the full amount. But he didn't. And so the price was actually reduced because the town, you know, couldn't confirm that it was clear title. But that but the all the land was transferred to the town. So that's on the assessor's true. maps, it's town of Menden. I, 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 I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that. You're going to tell a homeowner that he's encroaching on property, and and we don't even have clear title to it. Well, the thing how is, do we is that, enforce that how do we how do we enforce that when we don't have clear title to it? Well, I mean. I mean, at this point in the records, we do own it, but um, and the thing is, is like well, we. I, could I, try I, know, to... I know what we voted. I know what the discussion was during our during our meetings. We discussed it more than once. I've had emails with you on it because I I feel strongly that we should not be taking property that doesn't belong to us. I mean, just because the town just because the property doesn't have clear title doesn't mean that the town owns it. Do you? I mean, do you think that? the town should use money to clear the title that's and it's not up only to me. what'd you say that's i said that's not up to me i mean that's that's something that the town would have to have to decide on yeah and i should I clarify wouldn't, i wouldn't i wouldn't be i wouldn't i wouldn't spend funds on it i mean there were developers that tried to get clear title on that to develop it and they couldn't do it so let me just clarify to other people that most of the property the town does have clear title on. It's just this section right here. C can you see the cursor? Yeah, but it goes that deep into the area of of where the town would belong. I, I get I see the little jog in the the property lines. That's what Barry was talking about where they cut off the um the back. So yeah. for, so I guess for tonight's discussion then, I would like to put a sign. We can uh, we cannot do it down here, but I would like to put a sign here, here on all the straight edges of these properties. Except for this one has a stone wall, so I don't think we need to put signs because it's pretty clear. I don't have a problem putting signs on on the the survey that we had, we had approved on the previous meetings, as, as we discussed. So that would be force. Well, I don't. What do other people think? I mean, there's a stone wall here, and there was no signs of encroachment. So we probably don't need to put it on the stone wall, but it would just be one, two, three signs. Then, what do pe other people think? That works for me. The three signs. I don't think you need it at the stone wall. Okay. Yeah. I think that's reasonable right now, Anne, um, with the three signs. Okay. And what do other people think about the, the title on the property? You know, I mean, it's like on the records, the town owns it, but part of it isn't clear title. And I just don't know. It could be like, you know, a lot of money to clear the title. And I, I think. Barry makes some good points. Um, you know, assessors' maps aside, which are notoriously inaccurate, um, even if there's a deed recorded, that doesn't mean that there's clear title to it. So I think there's a question. There's uh, been a long-standing question as to that, and I think the point he's making is, you know, that. Um, uh, that becomes a little bit difficult to um, 
you know, notify a landowner that, uh, you know, there's an issue there when we know that the title isn't clear. Um, so I think that's the point he was trying to make. I think it's a reasonable point, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I tend to agree with that. Okay. Well, if at yeah. some point, oh, Peter, if someone's yeah, going to say I, something. I hear Barry's comments, and I hear Frank's, and I wouldn't want to spend money trying to make the claim, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, the owner who bought that new lot shouldn't have the claim to the back land. He knows what he bought. Whoever has the claim on whatever, uh, what's his name that we bought it from, that I would think would be something further back lost in history. And why should this new owner be able to go beyond what he bought to put up a shed on somebody's land if it's not his. Yeah, I have a feeling that um, the person that's encroaching on the property is encroaching on the part of the property that is an unclear title. So I think the the parcel that the town sold and all the way up, I don't think there's any encroachment on that. I don't think, but I'll find out next week. So there's always the question of who, if it's useful to clear a title, but if there, but who pays for it? Yeah, you'd have to probably it would be like a November town meeting asking for money to do it. Um, it's 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 tough. These old parcels, you, they're really hard to unravel, and so a lot sometimes, yeah, you know. Yeah, I think that uh, based on what I hear and and what I've been told that uh, a number of people have performed those title examinations and uh, with with great effort to clear that title. And, and that happens. That's not unusual, especially in an old town like Menden. Um, so you're probably looking at a land court action, which uh, again, might take years and of great expense, but that to make the point that that's how you would ultimately be able to clear the title if the records, the, the recorded records are unclear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is a thing where I kind of had it like, um, you know, on the back burner uh, that, um, uh, sort of the back burner that we should clear the title of this land, but then it's like, Oh man, there's so many other things to do that we haven't. So we'll put it on the back burner. We'll put the three signs up. Um, well, so actually, I'd like to put the three signs up on Inman Hill, but then eight signs on the the other property. So that's eleven signs. And um, to put up the eleven, have the, to, to buy the signs, the poles, and have them put in. It's like eight hundred ninety one dollars. We have $477 in this year's account. So if we use that, then it would be $314 out of next year's budget. And, and that's that motion. what? I'll make that motion to spend the money out of this year's budget, next year's budget. Put up the signs on Pond Street and the three signs on Inman Hill. I'll second, Frank. Okay. So it's um, signs on um, Indian Hill Road properties, and it's actually um, George Street properties and a Pond Street property. Okay. Um, any more discussion? All right, all those in favor? Barry, aye. Carolyn, aye. aye. Peter, aye. Okay, great, and, and aye. All right, all those, um, that's unanimous. All right. Um, the other thing too is that um, in the past we've had Boy Scouts, which are Scouts now, um, you know, help with different projects. But uh, and I have a lot of things they could do, like putting in signs is something that they can do. Mm -hmm. But I would I don't know who the leaders are of the troops now. So if somebody wanted to investigate that, it would be very helpful. I know one of them is Jason Cooter, but I don't know who the other troop is. And I don't know like the Girl Scouts, who they are um, or the Honor Society. But the, sc the Scouts are good groups to do it because they like to be in the woods and, you know. 
So if anybody wants to do that, let me know and coordinate some of this. You know, they have saved money in the past and, and they like so, you know. Um, and I think that's the last item. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I don't at the um, last night's select board meeting, uh, the town sold or they were um, they put two properties up for bid. One of them was on Route 16, which is across from the um, drive in. And it's in front of like where the solar panels are. And they um, gave the bid to a storage company that will put like storage units in there and they would buffer at the front like with vegetation. But that company will also um, give the town seven acres of open space, which would abut the open space um, that's called Muddy Brook North. And it's around Muddy Brook in that location. And they'll put in parking and it actually spend up to $40,000 in helping us develop a trail. In that area, so that's pretty cool. Where was that land in? Well, you know, um, the Muddy Brook North. It is the land that um, parallels Route 16, starting at North Avenue, and then parallels Route 16, and then goes up along Muddy Brook. And it's about 24 acres, and so then they're um, going to give between six and ten more to that. So is that the big pine grove? Yeah, yeah, and the, the right know, side of it's all gravel. It's across from the end zone. Yeah, it's the, in that general uh, area. Yeah, yeah. 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 And Where they uh, took all the topsoil off. Yeah. Okay. So they're going to put storage units in there. Is that what that, that's what they're proposing? Yeah, if they accept it, they will put storage units in there. Um, and then, but the town required that they would have to put up some kind of a, a vegetative buffer. So. So, and they sold it for, oh boy, like $400,000 or $500,000. So the town is getting that money. Mm -hmm. And um, plus they're getting the taxes from that. And this is some, this is a property that the town's been wanting to sell for commercial. So yeah, right. it's, and it's not going to affect, it's not going to affect the taxes for schools oh. and stuff. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unless they're storing kids in the storage units. But I don't <laughs> so, um, don't be surprised. Mo Moford had a couple people live in the storage units. Oh, did they? Oh, oh yeah. Sad. Yeah. Um, then the other property is 8 Morrison Drive, which is the property that's near the fire station. And a building was built um, that potentially could have been the police station. And but we ended up putting the police station in the um, main part of town. So anyways, yeah, yeah. Um, um, there's one bid, two bids. One bid was um, under the price, and so they couldn't accept it. And then the other one was um, from the Meehans, and that sold for like five hundred thousand dollars. But there was a lot of contingencies that came with that, so I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with that. And this does not include the access that we need to get to the Applewood open space behind the property. So we're, we're still working on that easement. So the second property is, is hang on, I, I get it about where the storage units are gonna be. Yep. Um, more, where is Morrison Drive? Um, well, you know where the senior center is? Yeah. Oh, yes, I know, yes. Yes, yeah. it's one of those roads on the right, yeah. Yeah, and then okay. if you take that right and then you take a left and you come into cul-de-sac and then the, the fire station and straight ahead is the police or yeah. the potential police station. Yeah, yeah. Where and they were so, hand where they were building it from with volunteers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Got it. It's critical that we have access through that properly, through that property, especially where we're restricted going through the other subdivision. Yes, and so actually I was out there today and I've, I've gone there with Jack Hunter, who's the planner, Menden planner, and um, there's like three acres that we can cut off the property to get to that access. So I'm working right now with Gary and Howland to have the survey made so that that property, that section would go with the conservation restriction. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Very good. Yeah. Um, All right. And that's about it. Anybody else have anything? No, I'm good. Nope. Motion okay. Adjourn. Just want to say I thought that was an interesting town meeting we attended. So. Oh my gosh! Yes, it was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> what last night? No, the town meeting, the annual. Oh, I town missed meeting. it. I was. I missed it. I was. You mean up for the candidates? The town meeting, the annual town meeting. You know, like where you have the warrant. Oh, yeah, we were yeah. away. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. You were in Washington. Yeah. No, it was. Yeah, it was a very interesting meeting. Yes. Uh, and I loved the clickers for voting. I thought that was great. Oh, wow. Well, I'll have to get the lowdown from you, Ann. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we were out of town. So Barry made a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Did someone second it? Second. Peter seconds. Uh, Peter. Too, Frank. Okay. I'll, I'll third it. All right. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Um, right. Frank, Good did night. you take notes? I did. They're a, a little uh, sporadic, but I'll do my best. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Sounds All right. wonderful. Take care, everybody. All right. Good night. Enjoy Bye. the Celtics. Go Celtics. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> See you guys.